You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, can big oil make big changes? BP's chief executive tells Sky News the company can help the world go green. Why we'll all be using much more electricity in the future as countries race to reach net zero. And the man working to bring renewable energy to Africa. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. And we aim to take you to the heart of the climate crisis, explain the data driving the changes that are already affecting us, but also show you just how far we've come. Well, coming up, how scientists in Australia are trying to save the platypus at risk of extinction because of extreme weather events. But first, let me take you over to our data dashboard and I can show you here just how much our planet has warmed since the Industrial Revolution. It's this figure here. Now, in 2015, countries agreed to try and keep that number below 2 degrees, preferably to 1.5 degrees of warming. Now, doing that will mean big changes from big oil and gas companies such as BP. Well, our business presenter, Ian King, has been speaking to their chief executive and we'll hear from him in a moment. But first, let's take a look at what the oil giant is doing to address their role in the climate crisis. So BP has pledged to become a net zero company by 2050. Now, their aims include a 50% cut in the carbon intensity of products it sells, but not actually to stop the production of fossil fuels. Now, it plans to reach net zero by selling $25 billion of assets in the next four years, which will fund renewable investments. And that includes projects like two offshore wind farms in the Irish Sea. BP and its partners paid £924 million for the licence to build them. But oil isn't out of the picture for BP. This time last year, the COVID-19 pandemic had a catastrophic impact on the global oil and gas industry. And you can see here how low prices plummeted from around $70 per barrel to as low as $20. But it is making a comeback. And that's something BP's chief executive, Bernd Looney, thinks will continue. He told Sky News he can see a continued demand for oil with prices staying at around their current levels. There is uncertainty on the demand outlook, but it is very strong in America. It's very strong in China. And of course, we've got the stabilizing influence of OPEC, who has both the capacity and the desire, it seems, to hold the market in that sort of $60 to $70 world. So lots of uncertainty as usual. The stabilizing influence of OPEC in the background, we feel quite good about the outlook for price. Well, Bernard Looney was speaking to our business presenter, Ian King, who joins me now. So, Ian, BP have pledged to become net zero by 2050. But does that mean it's cutting back on its oil production? Well, yes, it genuinely is, Anna. I mean, the main commitment that BP have made is that by 2030, they'll have cut their uh, oil and gas production by 40%. That was from February last year. Now, last year alone, their uh, production fell by around 10%. It's fallen again in the most recent quarter on an underlying basis, around 14%. And Bernard Looney expects it to continue falling in the current quarter as well. That's partly due to maintenance and outages associated with that and also due to those asset disposals that you mentioned. But they are genuinely reducing their oil and gas production. And indeed, in June last year, Bernard Looney actually went on record as saying that uh, some of the uh, assets that they have would actually remain in the ground. In other words, exploration acreage that they bought, they will no, no longer be producing. So they are putting their money where their mouth is to that extent. But it's worth bearing in mind that this year they'll invest something like 13 billion US dollars altogether. Nine billion of that will be in their conventional fossil fuel activities with the remainder going on renewable. Well, I asked Bernard Looney earlier about COP26 in particular and how enthusiastic he was about progress being made. Green companies, low carbon, zero carbon companies are fantastic. But regardless of the growth rates, they're not going to solve the world's problems. What the world needs is greening companies. And by greening, I mean companies like BP who are carbon intensive today, but who have net zero ambitions. Mark Carney says, if you want to solve climate, go to where the emissions are. Well, the emissions are here. We're transitioning. How do we encourage and support greening companies? 
Now, companies like BP are often accused of greenwash, of uh, making promises that they can't keep. But what's really interesting, I think, is that BP have, over the last 12 months, got a considerable amount of buy-in from the likes of Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, who do seem genuinely convinced that they are sincere in their approach. The bigger question, perhaps, is investors. A lot of investors here in the city are yet to be convinced that BP is going to, in future, make the same returns on a financial basis from renewables that it does from its conventional fossil fuel activities. Ian, thank you. Now, let me take you back to our data dashboard. And in order to keep this number here as close to 1.5 degrees as possible, the world is going to have to move towards using clean energy. Now, that means a much bigger reliance on electricity, which can be produced and consumed in a renewable way, rather than other energy sources like natural gas, which can't be. Well, a new report from the Energy Transitions Commission says there'll have to be a massive mobilisation of resources to move from fossil fuel generated power Power to clean electricity. So, how are we doing in Great Britain today? Well, as you can see, 50% of our electricity today is coming from fossil fuels. We've got 34% coming from renewable sources and 16 there from nuclear. Well, that ambition to make everything electric is going to have a huge impact on the global supply of electricity. Now, in 2020, around 27,000 terawatt hours of electricity were supplied worldwide. And 10% of that was generated by wind and solar power. The rest is primarily fossil fuels. But the demands by 2050 are going to be almost five times as much, with around 130,000 terawatt hours needed. Now, to reach net zero, between 75 and 90 percent will have to be wind and solar, and the rest zero carbon. So let's take a look at three of the biggest growth sectors for electricity, and you can see that electric road transport goes up to 17,000 terawatt hours. Heating buildings with electricity will take up 22,000 terawatt hours and electric base advances in shipping and aviation could use up to 12,000 terawatt hours. Just those three together is more than the entire global electricity demand of last year. Well, Faustine de la Salle is the director of the Energy Transitions Commission, which produced the report with those findings. Faustine de la Salle, if countries around the world are going to achieve net zero, just how important is the electrification of many aspects of our lives? Clean electricity is really going to be the foundation upon which we can develop the whole energy transition. Um, we're um, uh, figuring out that uh, electricity will probably represent 70% of our final energy consumption uh, by mid-century. And that means, as you've just uh, shown as a number, a major uh, massive investment required in the production of electricity because we need to do two things at the same time. We need to uh, decrease the carbon intensity of our current power production. And you've shown the UK numbers today. They're better than they would have been 10 years ago, uh, but they're still not good enough. Um, but we also need to grow that electricity system very significantly. Well, yes, it sounds like a huge challenge. And obviously, the ambition is to make sure the electricity is powered by renewable sources and not fossil fuels. So how would you describe that challenge? I think the main challenge here is really to leverage private finance. Uh, there is money in the world that can invest in those uh, renewable energies and renewable energies today are becoming cheaper than fossil fuels production. So it makes business sense to invest in renewable energy, but we need a design of the market uh, that actually enables people to make money out of it. Uh, and that's what we call power market design. It's on governments to ensure uh, that um, investors can make money by investing in renewable energy. And what do governments need to do? Uh, it's uh, quite simple. It's about how you manage your electricity market. And it's about doing what we've done successfully in Germany, in the UK, uh, for several years now, um, which is auctions, uh, giving people the certainty that they will have um, a revenue for renewable energy over long periods of time that enables them to invest safely uh, with a certainty of revenue. Faustine de la Salle, thank you very much indeed.
In today's other climate news, the National Trust is restoring a wetland in Cornwall to help attract new wildlife and reduce flooding. The original floodplain at Coat Hill was converted into four acres of farmland by the Victorians nearly 200 years ago. The charity says turning it back to wetland will help store carbon in the mud and trap sediment to clean the river. Australian scientists are on a mission to save the platypus from extinction. The team from the University of New South Wales have been tracking down and tagging the animals to monitor their population. Platypus numbers have dropped by as much as 30% in the last 30 years as their habitats have been destroyed by flooding and wildfires. And Maisie Williams has become the first global climate ambassador for WWF. The actor, best known for her role in Game of Thrones, will support the charity's mission to turn the climate crisis around by 2030. She says if we all make small changes, we could create a meaningful impact. Now, for the latest in our series of Climate Diaries, and today we're hearing from Tony Tiu, who's on a mission to get Africa to embrace renewable energy. More than half of sub-Saharan Africans don't have access to reliable electricity, but Tony's working on a green solution. Hello, or like we say in my language, Zule. I am Tony Tiu, the founder and the CEO of Renewables in Africa. I used to be part of an engineering organization in the UK where I saw this very famous satellite image showing the distribution of power across the globe. And I was literally in shock and still am. Why? Up until that moment, I never realized how serious the power situation was in my beloved continent, Africa. I grew up in Cameroon. I used to be in the dark with few lights. And it's up until you get confronted, right? with a different set of reality that you start to understand the challenge you are facing. This picture changed my whole career and my whole life. Our goal is to educate people and raise their technical awareness of renewable energy. Our second mandate is to be an engineering company. So we bring clean energy solutions to businesses. We may not be one of the biggest polluters in the planet. We nevertheless feel in the brunt of climate change. My mission is simple, is to bring back power to Africa. And our vision is to turn the dark continent that I saw in 2008 into a brighter and prosperous one by 2040. That's everything from us for today. Tomorrow, we'll be speaking to former F1 world champion Nico Rosberg about Extreme E, the racing series raising awareness of climate change. And you can catch that on The Daily Climate Show here on Sky News and our social channels. See you then. Thanks for watching.